column base plate connections are the crucial interface between the steel structure and the foundation. These connections are used in buildings to support gravity loads which bears on the concrete foundation, as well as the lateral loads that are resisted by the anchor rods and the concrete bonding to it. In addition, they are used for mounting equipment and in outdoor support structures where they may be affected by vibration and fatigue due to wind loads. Five different load cases are discussed in this video when it comes to the design of the base plate and anchor rods. Concentric compressive axial loads, tensile axial loads, base plate with small moments, base plate with large moments, and shear. The general behavior and distribution of forces for a column base plate connection with anchor rods will be elastic until either a plastic hinge forms in the column, a plastic mechanism forms in the base plate, the concrete crushes in bearing, the anchor rod yields in tension, or the concrete pullout strength of the anchor rod group is reached. When a column base resists only compressive column axial loads, the base plate must be large enough to allow the concrete to resist the bearing forces, and the base plate must be of sufficient thickness to have a high enough base plate yielding limit. The design bearing strength on concrete is defined in ACI 318 section 10.17 as follows when the supporting surface is not larger than the base plate. When the supporting surface is wider on all sides than the base plate, the design bearing strength above is permitted to be multiplied by the following, where A1 is the area of the base plate and A2 is the maximum area of the portion of the supporting surface that is geometrically similar to and concentric with the base plate area. The resistance factor phi is equal to 0.65. The bearing stress on the concrete must not be greater than the available strength. For axially loaded base plates, the bearing stress under the base plate is assumed uniformly distributed and can be expressed as follows. This bearing pressure causes bending in the base plate at the assumed critical sections as shown in green. The bearing pressure also causes bending in the base plate in the area between the column flanges. The required strength of the base plate can be determined as follows. Where the critical base plate cantilever dimension L is the larger of M, N, and lambda N prime. And lambda can be calculated as follows using the concrete compressive strength and resistance factor previously shown. Lambda can conservatively be taken as 1. The resistance factor for this case is 0.9, and the minimum required thickness of the base plate would then be the following. For hollow steel section columns, adjustments for M and N must be made. For rectangular hollow sections, both M and N are calculated using yield lines at 0.95 times the depth and width of the hollow section. For round hollow section and pipes, both M and N are calculated using yield lines at 0.8 times the diameter. The lambda term is not used for rectangular hollow sections and pipes. The design of anchor rods for tension consists of four steps. Determine the maximum net uplift for the column. Select the anchor rod material and the number and size of anchor rods required to resist uplift. Determine the appropriate base plate size, thickness and welding to transfer the uplift forces. Determine the method for developing the strength of the anchor rod in the concrete. The maximum net uplift for the column is obtained from the structural analysis of the building for the prescribed building loads. When the uplift due to wind exceeds the dead load of the roof, the supporting columns are subjected to net uplift forces. In addition, 
Columns in rigid bands or braced bays may be subjected to net uplift forces due to overturning. The limiting tension on a rod is based on the minimum area along the maximum stressed length of that rod. For an anchor rod, this is typically within the threaded portion. ANSI-ASME B1.1 defines this threaded area as follows where D is the major diameter and N is the number of threads per inch. The following table summarizes the available strength of the rods based on their nominal diameters and material. Please note that these values refer only to the strength of the rods themselves and the resistance of the concrete should still be calculated. ACI concrete pullout strength is based on the ACI Appendix D provisions. The resistance factor phi is equal to 0.7 and psi 4 is 1.4 if the anchor is located in a region of a concrete member where analysis indicates no cracking at surface levels, otherwise it is equal to 1 and ABRG is the bearing area of the anchor rod head or nut. Hooked anchor rods can fail by straightening and pulling out of the concrete. A hook is generally not capable of developing the required tensile strength. Therefore, hooks should only be used when tension in the anchor rod is small. The pullout strength in the case of hooked anchor rods is calculated as follows. In the concrete capacity design method, the concrete cone is considered to be formed at an angle of approximately 34 degrees or a slope of 1 to 1.5. The CCD method is valid for anchors with diameters not exceeding 2 inches and tensile embedment length not exceeding 25 inch in depth. Per ACI 318 Appendix D, the concrete breakout strength for a group of anchors is defined as follows, where AN is the concrete breakout cone area for a group and AN0 is the concrete breakout cone area for a single anchor. For a single bolt, the area can simply be found as follows given the slope. In the case where the anchor is close to the edges, the area changes as follows. A minimum cover of 6 anchor diameters should be left to avoid problems with side face breakout. For a group of anchors in tension, the area can simply be found by calculating the overlapping areas as shown. A moment can be created by adding an eccentricity to the axial load. For small eccentricities, the axial force is resisted by bearing only. For large eccentricities, it is necessary to use anchor rods. Consider the following force diagram. The resultant bearing force is defined by the product QY, in which Q is the bearing stress between the plate and concrete multiplied by the width of the plate. Let us define a point A on the far right of the plate. The distance of the resultant from the center line of the plate epsilon can be calculated as follows. It is clear that as dimension y decreases, epsilon increases. y will reach its smallest value when q reaches its maximum. For moment equilibrium, the line of action of the applied load PR and that of the bearing force QY must coincide that is E must be equal to epsilon. In summary, for values of E less than epsilon max, the moment is small and no tension will develop in the rod. A critical value of eccentricity of the applied load combination is the following. The eccentricity should first be calculated from the applied moments and axial loads. Then, it is compared to the critical eccentricity to determine whether the moments are small or large. The concrete bearing stress is assumed to be uniformly distributed over the area Y times B. In the case of small moments where the eccentricity equals epsilon, 
the equation can be rearranged to solve for y. And by equilibrium of forces, the bearing force Qy must be equal to the applied force Pr, and thus the bearing stress can be calculated as follows. And then compare to the available bearing resistance of the concrete. The bearing pressure between the concrete and the base plate will cause bending in the base plate for the cantilever length M in the case of strong axis bending and cantilever length N in the case of weak axis bending. For the strong axis bending, the bearing stress FP is calculated as such. The required plate bending moment per unit width can be then determined according to these two cases. And then compare to the available bending resistance per unit width of the plate. Considering the following force diagram and knowing that for large moments Q is Q max, we can apply the vertical equilibrium equations to find an expression for the tension in the rod. Also, the summation of moments taken about the point B must equal zero. Hence, Y has the following expression. If the following condition holds, there will be no real solution for Y, and the plate dimensions will need to increase. Use Y to calculate the tension in the anchor. Then compare the tension to the governing anchor strength, either anchor rod failure, concrete pullout, or concrete breakout. For the case of large moments, the required plate thickness may be determined from either equation based on the value of Y. The tension force T in the anchor rods will cause bending in the base plate. Cantilever action is conservatively assumed with the span length equal to the distance from the rod center line to the center of the column flange X. For a unit width of the plate, the required bending strength of the base plate can be determined as such. The available strength per unit length for the plate is given in this equation. Setting that strength equal to the applied moment provides an expression for the required plate thickness. There are three principal ways of transferring shear from column base plates into the concrete. Friction between the base plate and the grout or concrete surface, bearing of the column, base plate and or shear lug against a concrete surface, or shear in the anchor rods. In typical base plate situations, the compression force between the base plate and the concrete will usually develop shear resistance sufficient to resist the lateral forces. The contribution of the shear should be based on the most unfavorable arrangement of factored compressive loads that is consistent with the lateral force being evaluated. The shear strength can be calculated in accordance with ACI criteria, where AC is the contact area and mu is the coefficient of friction. Mu is 0.55 for steel and concrete and 0.7 for steel and grout. Shear forces can be transferred in bearing by the use of shear lugs or by embedding the column in the foundation. When shear lugs are used, shear is initially transferred through the anchor rods to the grout or concrete by bearing augmented by shear resistance from confinement effects associated with tension anchors and or external concurrent axial load. Shear then progresses into a shear friction mode. The recommended bearing limit per section B 4.5.2 of ACI 349 Appendix B is the following, where A1 is the contact area between the shear lug and the concrete. Accounting for the confinement effects of the tension in the anchors and the external axial load, the following term is added. For bearing against an embedded base plate or column section where the bearing area is adjacent to the concrete surface, ACI 318 recommends that the bearing strength is adjusted as so. For shear lugs or column embedments bearing in the direction of a free edge of the concrete, 
Appendix B of ACI 349 states that, in addition to considering bearing failure in the concrete, the concrete design shear strength for the lug shall be determined based on a uniform tensile stress of 4 phi times the concrete compressive strength. Acting on an effective stress area defined by projecting a 45 degree plane from the bearing edge of the shear lug to the free surface. The bearing area of the shear lug is to be excluded from the projected area. Using the AISC recommended hole sizes for anchor rods, considerable slip of the base plate may occur before the base plate bears against the anchor rods. Due to placement tolerances, not all of the anchor rods will receive the same force. It is recommended to use a cautious approach such as using only two of the anchor rods to transfer the shear unless special provisions are made to equalize the load to all anchor rods. Lateral forces can be transferred equally to all anchor rods or to selective anchor rods by using a plate washer welded to the base plate between the anchor rod nut and the top of the base plate. The plate washers should have holes 1 over 16 inches larger than the anchor rod diameter. If plate washers are used to transfer shear to the rods, some bending of the anchor rods can be expected within the thickness of the base plate. If only two anchor rods are used for shear transfer as suggested earlier, the shear is transferred within the base plate and the bending of the rods can be neglected. The strength of the rods in shear can be evaluated as follows. For the typical cast-in-place anchor group used in building construction, the shear capacity determined by concrete breakout is the following. The breakout cones work very similarly to the breakout cones in tension, where the ratio of the cone area in the anchor group to that of a single anchor is taken into consideration. Two possible breakout cones can control. If the inner breakout cone is used, then the shear force is considered to be shared equally among the four anchors for assessing breakout. If the outer breakout cone is used, then the shear force is taken by the two anchors furthest from the concrete edge. The table summarizes the dimension in which the larger breakout cone will control. In addition to the concrete breakout strength, ACI also contains provisions for a limit state called pryout strength. This happens when the rods are far from the edge and is expressed in terms of the breakout strength of a single rod in tension. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.